There it is. Bam. We are live. We're continuing our warm-up conversation. I'm bullshitting. Yeah, we can definitely uh, continue. We're officially streams good. Yeah. So, where were we before you took your little bathroom break? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were talking about... um. We were talking about kind of the redneck engineering stuff where it's like there's yeah. certain know-how, get after it, fuck it, we'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> fuck it, we'll do it live. This attitude. <laughs> right. Like, almost as we click live here, right? Like <laughs> yeah. this attitude, but in engineering, and that I would love to do that in psychology, and that it's like, can we just get the fuck after it? I mean, it's funny you say that because it's like Maybe it's just because of my predisposition to enjoying engineering as a, like a, I mean, it's really science at its core, but it's like engineering as a, like a, the practical boilerplate application of silence, science, right? Like, mm. cause like physics and mathematics can go super abstract and like, it, it kind of loses itself right in, into more like you can just get stuck in thinking land, right? Where you yeah. don't really see like how it boils down into an actual product or a physical thing. Whereas like math is, or not math, whereas engineering is kind of like, okay, you take all those advanced theorems, bring them back down into reality and say, okay, how do we actually think about these? Not as equations in a book, but like, what does that mean from like a product standpoint, a framework standpoint from like understand, like you don't even have to think about this like from a single product, but like understanding like, um, like product lines inside of a factory and how do you basically set things up so that you know exactly what your throughput is or like, what the idea is or, or even where to put people right because like maybe certain places are like in any system right need a whole bunch of physical attention whereas other yeah. places maybe need one or two people just to make sure things are running and it's that's why like i think of like redneck engineering where it's like you it's people who are just okay let's just roll up our sleeves and see where the problem like where do the fires show up so that we need to put those fires out hmm. that makes sense to me and i i totally get the like the being caught in thinking land yeah like I, seriously the older i've gotten the more i distrust this kind of super abstract thinking it's like because you can effectively justify anything with yeah. rationality if you think it long enough right you can find ways to to like right make things permissible right <laughs> people who are like dissociated or whatever will do this all the time it's that they who are really disconnected from their own kind of baseline experience of things, their emotional experience and so on, they will go around and do all kinds of crazy and impulsive things like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not drinking um, because I'm an alcoholic. I'm drinking because all oh, the games on, and it's not a big deal. And let me do this. Right. right. <laughs> In the week, some kind of justification for their addiction. And I saw this working in the court system um, with opioid addicts. It was like, mm -hmm. it was the same thing that every fucking move that they're doing is in order to acquire more opium, more right. or, or heroin, right? It's an opium. And it's kind of rational. It's kind of on this, it's internally coherent. And if they're really, really smart, they'll come up with, a very sophisticated, hard to argue against explanation for their behavior. Right. But at the end of the day, you just watch them and it's like, oh no, all of this is for heroin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, to, to do, to apply this in another way, I mean, it's part of the reason why I enjoy um, like wearable devices. It's, it, when I first got super into to, to them, it was kind of like, in the supplement world, like when you work out and stuff, like you, you see all these people, like, especially if you read any reviews about supplements, you'll always see people like, well, I feel great taking it, bro. Like, I mean, this is a kind of ironic and bring this up when the liver king got busted a week ago, but like, it kind of goes in those same vein where people, I, I just think that going by how you feel as like an objective, like an, a subjective thing, like, oh, when I take X, I feel great, right? Because you could take, you know, do cocaine and feel great. But does that mean it's good for you? <laughs> yeah. And this, the same, I think, is true for like when you measure your body's uh, biometrics. And that's why I got super into these, these new class of wearables with like Whoop and Aura Ring because 
it kind of calls you on your bullshit is, is really the way I see it. And I think that's like when, when you apply science correctly, it calls you on your bullshit in a sense that like, you can't lie to yourself and make up narratives and be like, well, I'm getting six hours of sleep, bro. Like, or I'm getting seven hours of sleep. I'm doing great. I'm doing fine. But then when you like actually look at your data, you're like, Hmm, are you really? Yeah, and it's right. not like, and like the difference, the difference in this, I think too, that like most people don't understand is that like, if another person is calling you on like telling you to sleep more, right. Or like cut back on your alcohol or something like that, you immediately want to bristle and push back and be like, Whoa, what are you trying to say, bro? Like, <laughs> like that kind of thing. Whereas like when you have an objective, just a, a data sheet that just says, here's how much you're sleeping. Here's how much you're drinking as good as you're reporting your data. Maybe yeah. you should, you know, maybe you should cut back. It's like, it's almost like and, it's too blunt to argue with. Right. And and then it's like you, you uh, coupling that with like a actual like reference point, at least with whoop, you can tell it's like when you drink, your recovery goes down by 11 percent. And it's like, well, can't really argue that one. <laughs> 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 you know, yeah. it's like it's like that's when engineering works well, because you can basically confront reality. And regardless of how you feel about the thing, it just gives you the it's just like, well, take it or leave it. But here's the reality. Yeah. Yeah. You're t yep. I, I understand that. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of have like a dual problem, you know, it's like, you can't really have one or the other. It's like, if you're looking at emotional um, or something like an emotional experience and contrasting it with an intellectual experience, then it's like, okay, if you just have the intellect, then you're just rationalizing anything that you want whatsoever. But if right. you're just having the, um emotional experience then in some sense nothing is constraining <laughs> that you yeah. know what i mean it's like they both constrain each other in a kind of an appropriate way there's a balancing act that's going on here where it's not where you're just caught in your emotions all the time and you're just acting impulsive um nor are you in some sense just lost in the hall of mirrors so like you, you need to be able to see things kind of as they are yeah, and not deny them or repress them or whatever, but try to understand them, appreciate them as it presents itself to you. Yep. And that's kind of it's like finding thing. a way to like tether, like it's like a weird, how would I say that? It's like balancing act, I guess is probably maybe the word like where you're like, you have your own internal experience of a thing or whatever, whatever you're measuring. Right. But then it's like you also have like the objective thing about that. And it's like trying to figure out like, okay, where is like the sweet spot of like marrying those two together? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. You have to find kind of a, a healthy balance between in some sense, all of these levels, right. And alignment yeah. between them. And it seems that the fundamental piece of that is just like pure, consciousness awareness of what's yeah, going on i call i would call it like presence like when i was dealing with flow and things like that is like figuring out ways to be as present as possible with the things you're doing in that moment mm. like whatever that thing that you're completely focused on is and it's it's when you're when you're able to like snap all of that in that's when you you know burnout goes away when the underlying stress of things goes away because i framed all of this on, in like a looking at like humans human recovery but really just like how you operate in a day-to-day -day basis as like a quality metric which you would be using like businesses or within um you probably have this in the lab too but it, it kind of comes from the lab where it's like you have a quality manager who basically oversees all of your processes and like how well is everything running right and we do this for all of our machines, all of our cars, right? Like you take in your car every couple of months to make sure that all the maintenance is done, even if there's nothing wrong, right? Like you're supposed to do that. But we don't do this for people. We just kind of throw it to the wind and say, well, let people figure out how to best optimize their lives. And lo and behold, we have like record high anxiety, depression, <laughs> burnout, you name it, right? Like, <laughs> and it's like, well, nobody tries to help people figure out how to, you know, be less stressful at their jobs or deal with the, the the things that they're just gonna have to deal with like having bosses that suck or whatever and it's like well how do you help yourself how do you help be less 
I guess negative reactive is like one of the buzzwords I would use. Hmm. Yeah, we we have there are in bigger labs lab managers that are doing this kind of work. Yeah, I'm sure you guys are too small for this kind of stuff, but three, that's kind of the idea. Three people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so not necessary at this point, but that's typically how it how it goes as like things start to scale. You have people who are act as checks and balances for like the quality, but it's like, okay, let's apply that level of quality to people's lives and see what happens. Cause I'm because like if you make people feel more fulfilled and like in their eight hours or whatever they're at work, then it's like they're recharged to go take on and like be a better friend, husband, whatever, you know, spouse, parent, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera because they feel like they are accomplishing things that matter to them. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that can be tough, right? Because there's a certain amount of self-efficacy that yeah. lends itself to that. And if you have a job that needs to be done, that's already being fulfilled by somebody else who feels self-efficacious in that position, but you have some other job that just no one wants to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, that, that can be hard. Right. Definitely. But I get the point that it's like, there must be some kind of way to organize this. Yeah. The way other way is like pivoting, right? Like, okay, maybe your job, like you don't like your job or whatever. You're trying to get to somewhere else. It's like, there, there can still be other ways that like fill your cup in that sense of like, okay, maybe you don't have that, but do you have like a hobby like a community building setting, like you like going to gyms or you set up um, something around the gym or some other community like building activity that allows you to put your effort into feeling connected, which then it's like, well, th today might suck here in, th in this block of my life. But then it's like, as soon as I get out of that, then I can, you know, yeah. expand myself in other areas. That could be fucking hard. I mean, part of it is like I'm thinking about um, if I was running my own lab, how would I run that lab? Right. Right. And that's kind of a different question than uh, if I run my own life, <laughs> how might I run that life? Right? <laughs> so these are a little more complicated things. And part of it is this is a weird problem that I'm coming up with now. It's like now that I'm 30 years old and I'm thinking about, I'm listening to comedians and stuff talking about who inspired them and mm -hmm. um, who their kind of um, mentors were or something like that. Right. Or? In some sense. And that it how it's like, oh, I've really, I learned so much from that person on this path. And I think about it, it's like, okay, the people that have influenced me on my path are all these kind of intellectual types. Um, it would be sort of strange to pivot, uh, at least careers, where it's like, it, it, at this point, it almost feels like I'm so deep down this road, there's no pivoting. Right. That'd be, that you kind of just have to suck it up. Yeah. And There's even so if buying at this point, the sunk costs would be astronomical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it's not that these things can't generalize in some sense. It's just like, fuck that at a certain point in life, you have to kind of weigh that, you know? Yeah. So who knows? Should we get started with the actual uh, thing? Yeah, I'm down. We're, uh, we're right at that 730 mark. So we, we've have sufficiently warmed up for those who cared. Um, but basically today is a continuation from last week's, um, live. We did a little bit on AI art because, you know, we kind of just, I just keep, I mean, it just feels like it's just getting bigger and bigger really as oh, of right yeah. now. It's just like the, the wave of people who are behind it now is just kind of, it's getting to that kind of like critical mass where I feel like there's a new article or something about this. Um, you know, there's a new trend on Instagram where people are using a separate app, not, not any of the ones we were talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> and they're just doing like these um simpler just it looks kind of like it's not really deep faking but it's like artistic um mashups of people's profile photos or photos you select on your instagram page it seems like i haven't used it myself because it's, i don't know it's just not as interesting to me because i've been doing this for <laughs> already yeah, control in mid journey yeah I, there's more artistic control of it it's like i i don't it's not it's cool it's fun that other people are getting into this but it's it's not what i'm interested in about this tech um but last week was more of like a technical discussion, kind of unpacking like how this stuff is made, um, kind of touching on some of the growing pains of the tech and like where the data sets are coming from, things like that. And then we kind of touched on ethical things, but really 
didn't get too deep into it and we thought it would be better just to do a separate one and considering how much has changed even in a week it, there's even more to say about it because it's a i don't know this is this is a, a crazy one honestly <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, part of the thing correct me if i'm wrong here so i'm i'm in this is half of a question and half of a statement right so mm-hmm. um lenza that's what it is i think is the yeah, app lens that AI. Allows, yep that allows you to uh use your profile pics with this instagram thing and suddenly yep. you can say um you know my profile pic in the style of Alphonse Mucha mm-hmm. or whoever. Right. And um, so that's, that's where part of this controversy is coming from. My understanding is that Lenza is dependent on stable diffusion and that's the AI that's being used. That's what it and looks like st- to me. Yeah. Okay. And stable diffusion is dependent on a particular database that is being criticized for not um that it just pulls at random and that there's artists work in that that those and the artists did not consent to have their art as a part of that database to be yeah okay. and from what i've read in a couple articles about this is that's kind of like a legal gray area that they're allowed to do this like from the from the data set that pulled all these images together which all these algorithms are based on because it's kind of a fair use thing but like it's still legally gray because it's not like anything is like this has ever been possible. Um, and so it, I think we might see something along the lines, like I guess to back up, Stable Diffusion has since released an update. Uh, they called it like a not safe for work filtering update t- technically. So they basically put some, uh, cause we were talking about this in last week, where stable diffusion was kind of a wild west where you could just yeah. generate anything you wanted. Um, but they they finally put some not safe for work controls into the algorithm so that you can't just go and blatantly create nudity and things like that, or, or probably grotesque slash uh, gory things, I would assume. Because yeah. mid mid journey already had um, things like that already where they could you couldn't do things like that. Um, even even so far as like uh, keywords, like I think they had like disturbed or something like that, or like some yeah. words that can be easily misconstrued or ter- twisted into a not safe work. Yeah, way. I had I had tried to say something like um, defiler. That was like one the, that got blocked. Huh, I had something like the rays of light were cutting through the clouds, and that yeah, was cutting. Yep, that yeah. makes sense. So things like that are, are changing, but also part of the stable diffusion update, they made it more difficult to pull in specific artist styles. So like if you go into any of these programs that are pretty open, you'll find basically real life artists who are being emulated constantly. Um, it doesn't take a very long, <laughs> it does not take very long for people to like realize that, oh, if I put this person's art in, I'll get something great. Totally like not surprising at all. The problem is that it's the amount of flood of images that can be generated in a short amount of time that then the real life artist, assuming they're living, is going to get drowned out by these, I mean, simulacrums, I guess is to use a fancy word for it. But it's like, I use this as an example. I feel like I've been posting on Facebook page. I should probably turn these into blogs or something at, the, at some point here when I have ideas about this stuff, because I just feel like I have an idea about like how to think about AI art <laughs> every day at this point. But one of the things I said is it's like, some of this it feels like say you want to become a painter and you're 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 just really inspired by leonardo da vinci and you could go and trace or copy the mona lisa and that's not to say that you couldn't figure out how to do a mona lisa but it it doesn't mean you're a great painter because the mona lisa has been done already and in some sense doing something based off of the inspiration of another person's and the ai has a data set that emulates it well it's like the same thing and it's so you the way i I try to go about this is like try to do something your own and if you are going to use someone else's work as a point of inspiration try to give credit if you're going to post it somewhere Mm -hmm. as to where that inspiration came from at least that's the way i think about this or at the very least like for me like i think like 99 percent of what i've posted is does not include any works other than like general like 
I use Spider-Man or Star Wars or like whatever. Like that's not owned by one particular person, but like a like a stylistic right, a character, thing. not a uh, yeah. Style. Like I'm not stealing from like one artist directly. I mean, it's like I can't say Spider-Man's my own, right? Like that nobody, everybody knows who created it, right? <laughs> but like if you're just some you know artist online who has a very specific style that just looks great, but most people aren't going to know that, right? Like how many good artists are out there on the internet nowadays? Mm -hmm. um, and it's like part of the growing pains with the internet, right? Where sharing and imagination and mixing of ideas is ubiquitous. It's like, where, how do we draw that line to be able to give proper credit to the person who's put real time into developing craft? And I think that's where the ethical like quandary is, is at right now. That's like what people are trying to like, where is that line? Yeah. And sort of the intuitive or gut reaction to this would be something like, um, the AI are just not allowed to use yeah. the or to derive images from artists that have come before it. But there, this is um, this misunderstands, I think, how these AI actually work. Mm -hmm. So part of it is that these AI are designed to imitate the way that human beings think. Yes. Right. So the replications, in some sense, of how the brain works. Um, and what happens as a result of that is that the AI aren't just plagiarizing verbatim from these artists. In some sense, they're very, very good at being inspired by an artist. Yes. Right. And so the, the AI look at a whole bunch of different art and they look at a whole bunch of different things. And it's worth noting that um, if I say, you know, do a picture of me. Here's an example of a picture of me in the style of Alphonse Mucha. Then uh, it's not just looking at Alphonse Mucha; it's looking at also the pictures that I provided for it, and a whole bunch of other things. And then that way, it's creating an original piece, and it might be in yep. a style of Mr. Mucha, and in, in in it's inspired by that, but it isn't. It isn't a copy. It's not one. Yeah, it's not one for one. And I, I was actually playing around with this because with everyone doing like the, the face app stuff with Lenzia, I was doing a whole bunch of just different stylistic versions of my own portraits um, with different portraits of myself with different lighting conditions. And a lot of people I would think would, their first reaction was that you're going to get something that looks really like you. And that's not t technically true. It depends on what the people who are designing the algorithm to do. Because at least with mid journey is they don't want to get to this deep fake territory because that's kind of creepy uh, yeah. or can it get creepy um, because you can then start basically infringing on people's rights. Say you use someone who's famous or pseudo famous or, or something like that. Right. And you start creating versions of their variants of themselves um, and making them say things or look at look in situations that they would not want to be in. Right. Yeah. Um, and so with what they've done with at least mid journey is you cannot just put in an image because if you, if they let you just put in a raw image and let the computer redraw it, it would get really close to the raw input. Um, because that's really not that difficult, right? Like if you just think about how powerful these algorithms already are, it's not a surprise that we get really accurate, but it requires you to put at least one prompt word along with your image or multiple images together to be able to create something at least more or original. Um, and the, the, the crazier thing is you find up any, end up finding viruses inside of the, the algorithms themselves of like the categories. Like when I would put like, uh, I did cyborg and like, I sent you some of these earlier, but it like really put squared and like hyper masculine to my face, which I was just like, this is ridiculous. Or, um, I did anime and it did a lot of like pseudo feminine features. And I was like, oh, well now I know what people are doing with anime. Like yeah, that's what these AI, yeah. right. It's <laughs> almost like 90%, you know, an anime females is what yeah. anime, the, the node of anime means. Right. And I'm like, it didn't even, and it gave me like long hair and like one side of my face. So I was like, this is so strange. Like get rid of this nightmare fuel. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can fuck with that by telling it anime male yeah i i thought so i just didn't have enough time to, like i was i was mostly just creeped out i was like yeah <laughs> i didn't want that anymore i was like i don't need this <laughs> but right but the idea there is that it's it's like okay we're not getting a one for one recreation it's not like yeah. i'm sitting down with the artist and they're painting me and now i'm right. not paying them for their work 
It's that this thing is kind of a weird amalgam of a bunch of stuff, including that artist's work, if you happen to name them. Yep, right? if you call them out specifically. But even more than that, it's like, okay, so what, what are you going to do? What are you going to regulate here? Are you going to regulate inspiration? Because if these models are behaving the same way a human brain does, and you try to regulate their behavior, then implicitly you may end up regulating a bunch of human behavior. Yeah. Like, okay, so an AI can't use a bunch of art unless the artist consented to it being inspired by it, right? Does that mean that human beings who have seen a whole bunch of art have to get a signature and a contract right. from the artists who are dead should zukolsky have gotten permission from rodan like what are we talking about here to some degree this is a little absurd now obviously the the um the clear line is between humans and ai yeah i think the problem is that it's because it's some sort of robotic facsimile is where people are getting tripped up it's tripping some sort of wire because like the the other example I, I've heard tossed around, which I agree with, is is in the world of hip hop music, right? Like hip hop is known or was built upon the idea of sampling, which is people taking beat tracks or different vocal patterns or instrument patterns and and creating, you know, stitching those together in unique or different ways, and then someone raps over it um, with their own lyrics or words, and then it's like people just mix and match like that. And that, to me, in a lot of ways, this version of like AI is kind of like that, but with images. And it just so happens you need to train on high quality images and who are the people you're going to go turn to, to get high quality images, the artists that exist, like, right. you're not going to tell the computer to like, okay, become a great artist. <laughs> yeah, and where else? Like what possible, it has to learn what art even is. Right. And so, it, so it has to learn it, from people. So it's like, it's not really stealing from people, but what it, what it's doing is it's, it's learning from the summation, or at least as so far as we're using so far, right? It's learning from the summation of humanity's total works, or at least a portion of them. Yeah. And that, that makes it complicated. Yeah. yeah it's like <laughs> the same thing, right? It's like an infant doesn't come into this world knowing what art is exactly, not in some obvious way. And they have to go in and experience this throughout their lifetime to slowly solidify something like a definition. Yeah. But the AI is doing the same damn thing. Yeah. It's like, okay, if you have a problem with how the AI is doing this, then you have a problem with how humans do it. Yeah. And if now you could say you have a problem with the fact that it's AI that's doing it, but in some weird way, that's discriminatory. <laughs> you know what i mean like that's right weird. it is it, that's a weird territory to be in i mean and i i'm i think i walk like this really weird line in this situation because i've i've been interested in the, these programs even before i had access to it like i just i just thought the idea of being able to like generate art with ai was just like it just whatever reason it just scratches an itch in my brain it's just like that seems fucking dope um yeah. because it's like i can maybe it's just because of my unique openness in like how i just my brain is, is where i have ideas bouncing around all the time and having a program that i can just type in a string of ideas and be like well i wonder what it would look like that because like, i don't really see it in pictures i just see like floating disjointed ideas of things you know um or just ideas that kind of run in back burner like you've seen it before joe or i've showed you my profiles like memento mori is like a really common theme of what images i've made and i just kind of put memento mori in a different subsection of themes and be like i wonder what the computer i wonder what like the the dreams of humanity would turn that into is kind of the way i think about it yeah um or whatever thing i'm interested in the moment of like it could be fantasy it could be cyberpunk it could be i read a thing and this quote sounded cool i wonder what that would look like as an image um and i i, I wrote this today in a post because i i went through some of my old photos where i was like I, I did Spider-Man in Dune and with V4, V4 is way different than V3 when it comes to like really emulating cool, well-done characters. And I just wanted to see what it would do. And 
a lot of this, what it feels like to me is like this childlike, wouldn't it be cool if, and then you fill in the blank. And, and then that's what it feels like. It feels like this childlike wonder of like, what would it be like if the things that I really like interested or curious about or, or scared about or just think are cool and you could get a really well done drawing or well done photo or well done render of those things. Um, and you just start getting to mash up those things you only could ever imagine in your head. I mean, I remember when we were little, we would talk about, you know, wouldn't it be cool if like Master Chief was doing this, that, or the other thing, or wouldn't it be cool in like, you know, Skyrim, there was this, or, you know, like all the games we played, it's almost like, how do you bring, or if you played tabletop where you have an imagination of like playing D and D, all you ever imagine is the character in your head, but you never get to see it. But what about all these people now that can type in the character they imagine in their head, and now they can create that character in real, in, in a quote unquote real life um, without having the, the barrier of not being able to properly without having the barrier of having a real artist that is like, I mean, you're going to spend real money to go create a D and D character. I mean, unless you're playing a D and D campaign for a really long time, but like the average person just isn't going to go through that extra step, but now yeah. you could right for very le like low cost. Yeah. And most people just don't have. Okay. So what you can imagine is that these AI that we are the unconscious of the AI, right? We're providing for it all the its fodder for generating imagery, yeah. right? But, and human beings have something like that, um, clearly in part because we have artists and these artists are able to generate spontaneous images that are remarkable in one way or another, right? Um, but most people just don't have access to their that part of themselves. They just don't. They're, they're off doing other things. Right, it's it's busy with life. <laughs> right. It's a, it, it is a peculiar kind of product that is that involved in their kind of dream life that they can produce imagery of this kind. Right. So mm -hmm. for many people, this is, this is a, a replacement for their imagination. Mm. It gives them access to things that they could otherwise just not, they just would not have. Yeah. Um, not that it isn't there in some sense serving a function. It's about access. They just don't have access to that thing so easily as a genuine artist does. And of course, it, that might be a good thing in part because it seems that a lot of the most successful genuine artists um, that are, had childhood <laughs> trauma, basically. <laughs> uh, I think there's some study that found that like um, it was that the most successful artists were much more likely to have had a parent die when they were, when the kid was young. Wow. It's like, to, it's it's really similar, like, like there's been a lot of comedians who've been interviewed and they're like, yeah, I got demons in my past. And then like, they would ask like, would you wish you could like get rid of those demons? Like, don't really think I would because I don't think I'd be able to tell these jokes. Like, right. it's like something about having like these demons inside of you. It could be experiences or imagined, right? Like, just psychological demons it's like i don't know there's something about it that like you need to tap into that if you really want to be a true artist whatever that means yeah it's almost like you're using all everything at your disposable it's disposal to solve an intractable problem yeah and the byproduct of that is a brilliant life's work of art you know um, so, you know, everything's a trade-off and one of the trade-offs <laughs> being a fantastic artist is being miserable. <laughs> so have fun with that one, I guess. Right. <laughs> act, it's like every actor is a fucking lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they literally, I honestly, this might be a hot take, but I think most actors are people who never, like who end up wanting to be other people more than they want to be themselves, which you yeah. could unpack that however you want, but you know, it's kind it, of an interesting something idea. like the the development of a solidified singular personality was disrupted to such a degree that they're in a constant search for an identity, and the way in which they do that is playing a bunch of mm -hmm. which one of these shirts fits. Yeah, that's very interesting. Like the, the acting, the ability to act, and all this is a byproduct of that whole thing. Yeah. Right, you you can't imagine that an enlightened individual, you know, the, the Buddha is not an actor. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I can't even like picture that at all. 
<clears throat> because the Buddha in some sense would recognize exactly what he's doing. Yeah. And has no need. He recognizes that it's an illusion. All that's an illusion. Yeah. This kind yeah. of leads me to like the, the, the ethical quandary that I, I keep seeing is like people seem to misconstrue like the agency in these programs. Like it, there seems to be like, as soon as you say the word AI, it means that the AI is doing things of its own accord. And, and that's just not the case. And I don't know if that's just a failing on like how we've articulated AI because of like how pop culture and films and books seem to paint AI into these like autonomous pseudo nefarious things. Um, and then like they assume that it's like, oh, well, it's a computer. So it's got no emotions. It's and it's just going to be soulless. And it's just there to like, like drain you of your life energy, which in this case of like AI art is is creativity and and like genuine human artistic talent. And I and I don't know. Like, I understand the worry in that situation, but like the other part of this is it feels like pushback at techno technological innovation because my brain immediately goes to like, well, how many people who got upset when like the Adobe program showed up with like Photoshop and Illustrator and things who are like, well, if you don't use pen and paper or ink and whatever, you're not a real artist. Like that's kind of what it feels like to me. Yeah. It's like people are trying to draw these imaginary lines of like, what is art in quotes? And they're like trying to move the goalposts to like detract again. Like to me, I see these AI tools as just another version, like another tool. It's just another way to get started. Yeah, I mean it's complicated, right? It's like it's certainly a I know, and there's there's a line here that's like moving, <laughs> obviously. Something. And I get that people are definitely trying to redefine what art or trying to define art in such a way that the AI can be excluded right it's it's almost yes. intuitive right they're they're not trying to define art they're trying to define art such that it excludes ai right? Right. so it's some, again the discrimination thing popping its head up <laughs> right 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 but in my view art is simply it's a trajectory it's not something inherent to any particular thing in some sense it's that i can't go to the store and buy five ounces of art. <laughs> and I mean, That'd not, be so uh, funny. Right. And it's like every painting, every great painting has some measurable weight of art in it. And it's like, oh, well, that's fantastic. Okay. Now I know that's art. It's not so simple. <laughs> it, yeah, that art right. is a process, it's a trajectory in my way of thinking. Hmm. It's that uh, art is bottom up. And so insofar as it's bottom up, it's art. And so in a human being, we're a compounded, it's something like compounded memories of our entire lineage. Right? So billions of years of experience um, accounted for by our nervous system that produces uh, imagistic representations of how you ought to behave in reality. But that, that thing is yeah. informed by every person in your ancestry, right? And pre-human and so on. I mean, this thing, this is ancient, this is billions of years. And that whole system bubbles up to produce some image that we call art, right? And you can have the opposite, which is propaganda, which is top down, which is that I have an idea and I'm trying to enforce that idea using the mediums that are associated with art painting or what have you to bludgeon you with a decision I've already made. Right? It isn't exploratory. It isn't the expression of some sentiment or ideal. It's the uh, solidified dogmatic imposition of ideology upon another person. And the yeah. only thing that art and propaganda of that type have in common is medium is that they're both painted for right. example and right image based or whatever you right right so happens. bottom up is art top down is propaganda mm -hmm. and these ai are doing bottom up work it, it's that it's just that we're one of the steps on the ladder moving upward we're we're a rung on that ladder 
right? And that it re yeah. is reliant on everything that we've created, but it is in the same way that human beings derive an icon from their ancestry, AI derive an icon from theirs. And we're the ancestors of AI. AI. It amalgamates our way of thinking. Yeah. To produce. We're, we're like breathing life into this new thing. In my, yeah. in my, like, if I let my like brain go and in, like into sci-fi land, if we're ever going to accidentally create like a general intelligence of some some kind, I, I think would almost be accidental in the sense of like you have this toy in the form of creating images, and then once it knows enough, there'll be some magical point where it just like clicks for some reason. Like, and this is kind of like a totally it's the singularity me. people talk right, about. yeah. Like it's basically kind of like that, where it's like somehow because it's just accumulate enough of human society or human culture or whatever you want to call it, whatever buzzword you feel like using, then it's like, Oh, I figured it out. Right. And then it might like be able to prompt you with something or whatever. Right. But I mean, yeah. we're not like these programs aren't going to be this, but like the grandchildren of these programs might be that good. Right. Um, and it's like, I think you're right to say like the bottom up top down thing because you see it. Right. But it doesn't, it, it does the bottom up, like the baseline is bottom up. Right. But then people, humans, again, go in and create the propaganda using this tool, right? Like, I'm sure you've seen it if you just like, like randomly languish inside of one of the group chats, at least in, in the Discord of Mid Journey, where people will create propaganda stuff. Like, I've seen Putin, I've seen Trump, I've seen Biden things. I've seen, you name it, whatever is like in the news, like that could be propagandized. I've seen Elon Musk, people making fun of him or, mm -hmm. or creating propaganda about him, things like that. And it's like, like here's human nature right like it just makes us more of ourselves like this the ai isn't doing this thing it's it's the it's the humans being human yeah. <laughs> and and like i love to say this thing i think it's, it's I, I maybe be broken record with it but it's like technology isn't destiny whatever you can imagine this technology doing doesn't mean it will end up doing that like the the thing the main driver in all of this is how people end up using it and like what we want it to do. And we have the ability to, you know, tell the co owners of the company, tell like vote with the dollars, vote with, you know, podcasts like this and have the hard conversations to be able to help people parse the complicated gray areas. Because I just don't, I don't know. I just, it's part of the problem is like when you talk about these hot button issues, like when you talk about nuclear, no one wants to touch it with a 10 foot pole because there's so much just negative press about it that nobody wants to give it an honest conversation because they just don't know, want like don't know how to talk about it intelligently. And it's like, what if at the bare minimum, we start putting guardrails on AI tech, all of a sudden we neuter something that isn't really like, I don't know what harm it's causing currently i mean in some sense like if you were an artist today and all of a sudden your name's starting to get thrown around this might be your time to shine in my opinion like yeah. you could leverage all this new bubbling up of like wait i'm my work is being referenced at how why what hold on like wouldn't you want to lean into that wave if yeah. you were like why wouldn't you want to i don't i don't know it's just like this it's almost this like this zero market. sum game it, it's weird. I mean, you okay? So you brought up uh, one of the real thing, the complicated things that you touched on was that yeah, people use what looks like a bottom-up system, like AI, mm -hmm. ostensibly creating art, in order to produce motivated top-down stuff. Right. Okay. So now this is running against my definition of art which is that mm -hmm. art is bottom up and propaganda is top down but what happens if what happens if bottom up is top down <laughs> <laughs> that's weird i don't quite what is what is the thinking with that what the fuck do you do with well that? because it's still because even if the algorithm itself is learning on real art mm -hmm. it still has like images of real people that then people can then get the AI to act in a way that is not artistic where you can get it to be propagandistic because it just has the thing and it has no agency. It just is like, well, this is what you want. Like, I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to spoon feed the thing you want. Right. It's like the, the agency, the real top down bottom up -ing is it's happening still here. It's still the people. Yeah. 
thinking about it. Right. It's, it's definitely still in that case seems to be in people. And so to some degree, it's like the, the nature of art is dependent on human agency in a peculiar way. Well, Uh, the way I would say, like, if I were to ever like put a byline, like if I had a gallery of like art that I put up, what, what it would look like in my mind is the authorship is my, me as like the thought agent, but then the, the pencil or the painter is mid journey is the way I think about it. It's like, cause it, it's like mm. there's because there's biases in the algorithm and how the algorithm is is structured such that if I were like if there was another version of this algorithm and I put in the exact same prompt, I would not get the exact same output. So there's like certain creative yeah. elements within that are embedded in Midjourney that it's hard to parse out. And so it's like a, it's a human machine symbiosis in real time where you have the human interfacing with the AI and such that you you also are t- learning the language of the ai so that you understand its outputs hmm. and like i know that sounds really fucking esoteric it's but... um <laughs> it interesting because it's it's more like um it's more like the ai is the technician yes and the person is the creator yes and that in so far as the creator is working bottom up as opposed to top down then it's art regardless of the technician so it's 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 to some degree it's who's the it's the agent insofar as the agent is operating in a bottom-up way Mm -hmm. it's art huh because the way I tend to think about it is like, okay, what is like a, a feeling I want to go for? Or what's like a thing that <clears throat> like either just a creative imagining or like I saying with the mashups, like wouldn't it be cool if, um, or if I'm just trying to understand like a sense, like, you know, like those moments like you talked about this before, Joe, where you have these really vivid dreams, right? And it's like, well, what if I just started putting these words of like this fragmented memories of this dream as phrases and what do, what does it do right like that's bottom up in my opinion mm-hmm. um like the other thing i i meant i don't know if i mentioned this last week's podcast but like i discovered you can throw in emojis into the program and then the program will put out really high quality images with strings of emojis mm-hmm. and it's the wildest thing i think i've ever done in this program so far and I listened into one of their live streams they did with the creator, with the one of the founders of the company. He's like, yeah, um, going to be honest, we didn't really plan on emojis working, but they do. And it's a happy accident that it does. Huh. <laughs> and so it's like somehow like through the image sets that they put in, it, it can interpret emojis. And it's like in, in some sense there, what we're seeing is like a rebirthing of hieroglyphics being reinterpreted into yeah massive embedded hieroglyphics right like like the the adage of of a picture is worth a thousand words like that is really 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 true like a hundredfold now Hmm. because like even if you're limited by words like you can put images into these prompts now which i mean if you're putting multiple images together and like if any if you put you know it's all worth a thousand words right so you have like some factorial summation of thousands of words layered upon each other and and i know this is getting into like crazy territory but like that's what we're kind of playing with when we're talking about images right it's like the story of humanity like we've been painting on cave walls since we've could probably do it if not even before cave paintings you know with rocks or you know placing them in certain ways or whatever (laughs) like i just feel like again it's we're just becoming more of ourselves and we just have more refined tools in which to depict these with ever increasing complexity and it's democratization of high fidelity. Hmm. It's a weird problem. It's very weird. Like I can totally see how it is that this is an extension of humanity. I don't know if it's true AI at that point in that um how would you say 
like all the sci-fi whatever movies and so on that we create picture ai as an equivalent to humans but yeah. smarter right walking around Basically. conscious presumably and, and typically uh, more emotionless too as well yeah and i imagine that that's an artistic flair but let's just say that it can have an emotion and so on yeah um What we're describing here doesn't sound to me uh, like that at all. It, it it just sounds to me like a dead thing, a zombie tool acting out the intent of its creator. Yeah, right. This is close to the paper cl clip problem from Nick Bostrom, who's a philosopher on mm. these things. And the paper clip problem is a warning about the dangers of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And then what you could end up doing is you could end up creating an AI whose sole purpose is to create paper clips. And it's not conscious and it's just a hyper effective machine with one reason to exist, paper clips. And it very quickly finds out that human beings are using all this steel for buildings and for water pipelines and for electrical infrastructure. And all of this is clearly uh, easily accessible fodder for creating more paper clips. So I'm just going to go collect that. And then as it's doing that, it comes into people who are f shooting at it. You know, it's little drones <laughs> collecting all this. And they're doing these things and it says, okay, here's an obstacle that I need to remove on my way to get steel in order to use for more paper clips. So it creates a system, like an immune system for itself, uh, that just kills every person that tries to stop it from collecting all this metal to create more fucking paper clips. And then before we know it, all of humanity has been wiped out uh, for the sake of creating a paper clip. And it's like, okay. <laughs> right. The, the inherent power to these systems makes them so inordinately dangerous that it doesn't need to be conscious. It doesn't need to be right. the kind of AI that we it imagine be aware. It from all these sci-fi movies in order to be a titanic force of destruction. It can be dumb. And so the kind of danger that I'm hearing with these kind of artistic AI mid journey stable diffusion is not the kind that I think of from ex machina or ghost yeah. in the shell, but is the paperclip kind. That's dumb and unconscious and derivative of human production. Mm hmm. And that actually makes it also very dangerous. That scares me more, I think, than the conscious thing. The only thing I can see in this situation, though, is it's it's like if people stop using it, interfacing with it, and posting about it, this goes away. Like it goes, it just like like if you put such a guardrail on it that the the expression of creativity or whatever you want to call it these programs just languish and there's no more money being put in them. So they never get better. Um, yeah, but, it, that we're, but it, I think, it. I think, the, coming in. yeah, I mean, I think the genie is out of the bottle, especially with a lot of these things. It's just a matter of where, like, what are we going to guide it? Right. It, it's another common theme I have with this. It's like being a steward of the technology. It's, it's what shape do we want it to take? Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, again, I don't really have answers. I just have lots of thoughts. <laughs> and it's because it's, yeah. it's a sticky situation. And, and a part of the problem is that not even problem, but it's like now. Historically, something like this would be something that's in a lab, in a research group at a university or in a think tank. And, you know, maybe a handful of people get to tinker around with it. And that's about it. But now this thing, these things are able to reach a critical mass. Millions of people can use these things for hours on end um you know and i think part of the i for me at least the worry is, is with people online so much and things like that and 
there's not a lot of people who have the requisite knowledge to be able to discern fake from real, right? Like from a deep fake standpoint or propaganda standpoint, right? Like, you, or if you have it such a low quality image anyways, right? You can re-age these things to make it look like it's manufactured in such a way. My personal take is that the danger is people creating fake things that look real. And then somehow it gets picked up on the internet and people start talking about it and it starts tanking, you know, it'll inadvertently affect like the stock markets or something like that. Right. This is, this is <laughs> in these hyper. Okay. So Baudrillard, the philosopher Baudrillard had this idea mm -hmm. of hyper reality and hyper reality is when you get copies of copies of copies of copies mm -hmm. until um, the things that you're seeing, and there's a, such a polar proliferation you of, <laughs> copies of things that they actually crowd out your experience of reality so yes. a good example of this is um times square right mm. there's paved streets there's tall buildings there's marketing everywhere and it can be so pervasive that you begin to think that that's the norm but that actually is reality there's no reality left to see it's all fake images right and you're talking about how um, we could create a whole bunch of uh, fake things uh, that, in some sense, um, the people latch on to. They start to begin believe that those things are real. Yeah. Right. And I had a conversation with um, a guy in my program recent, semi recently, that was about uh, about the same thing. Where it's like, okay, what's going on there is that when somebody gets fake news, for example. Right. It, let, whatever. Let's just, for the sake of argument, say that yeah. <laughs> it is actually fake. It, it, you know, not just yeah, uh, not not as the term. <laughs> right, right, right. It's actually fake news. Uh, and everybody begins to believe that that thing is real. Everybody begin, begins to believe that that bit of information is real, and so they act as if that thing is real. And then they reinforce each other. And then the consequences of them acting as if that thing is real converge on the consequences that would occur had that thing been real from the outset. Right? Because now that we've accepted oh, this whole good. thing as being real and we acted out, now all the byproducts of that are a very clear imitation of what we would have done had it actually been real. Right. In part because we're behaving the same way as we would have had it actually been real. Right. <laughs> we don't know that it's bullshit. <laughs> right. And this is the kind of thing, this is the part that I rubbed up on because the implication there is that if we all believe that it's true, it's true. And people will talk like this all the time. Oh, yeah. Right. And they'll say that it's true because the consequences end up being the same. But they're actually short-sighted on this piece. They don't go far enough. Mm. And that's the scary bit. It's like it's true. And then the consequences begin to behave as if it was true. Or convert on something like truth. But reality continues to move and ripple with its butterfly effects, regardless of our awareness of that thing. And so we begin to act as if something is true when the structure of reality reflects that it is not. And then soon enough, we diverge from reality to such a degree that it snaps back. Like a rubber band? Right. And we have a hard collision with what reality is. And that's the real scary part. It's because reality doesn't pull punches. <laughs> right. Ever. Yeah. I mean, that's a kind of a, a major worry. And I think, I mean, we're seeing some reaction to that, I think, with like people choosing not to follow the metaverse and that's been tanking um but yeah like we're i think we're at a 
a crossroads here of like what direction do we want to take of like if it's um if it's you know do we want to start creating all these digital facsimiles of of things and like if we're so enamored by like the digital reality that we could live right like in the dystopian <laughs> in the dystopian bullshit right like you get this uh um idea of where people are like sitting in haptic suits with vr goggles on and they just live in their digital world but then they're like in their real lives their house is just a you know ramshackle squalor with nothing around them right it's drab it's maybe not put together well or just like it's just good, good enough to live right basically and it's like okay like I, that's i think where the, the battleground of all of this leads right like if we get past this argument of of ai generated art and things it's like okay how do we pivot in such that we can make this something that enriches our lives rather than takes from our lives yeah it's very very dangerous if these people living in these haptic suits in their own world yes uh, deviate from the nature of the reality that they're in because you could be sitting there getting you could have a fucking feeding tube in you yeah and that's when some of the ai like the sci-fi stories say like they have haptic suits on that give you like have a catheter and you know bathroom like you don't have to unplug ever <laughs> all kinds of pervy shit things covering your vision in your ears a feeding tube jammed down your throat a breathing tube in case you fucking nearly die or something mm -hmm. and you can believe that your whole world is the way that it looks in the simulation but it's deviating from the slow deterioration of your body in reality and you'll go on living a fantasy until the moment you catch cancer and then you'll be ripped from your bullshit and thrown back into the nature of things to suffer suffer the consequences of your disinterest and it's like okay that's a fucking dangerous game to play mm -hmm. and so the real question is ai is already out of the box it's too late it, it it's already done like there's no there's no slowing this thing down as far as i can tell it, it just will yeah. not happen I mean, it's like, I feel like it's just ratcheting up at this point, right? Like, yeah, so like, even if we just talk about AI art in the sense of like, or AI, not just in the art sense, like AI is everywhere. Like it's embedded in just about everything in the, in the shows that you are watching. Those are served to you based on an AI algorithm that has learned about you. The, um, Spotify does the same thing. It's basically figured out a sound profile that you enjoy, and that's how it creates all those different mixes and things that you enjoy. I think Apple probably does something similar nowadays. So it's yeah. like even if even if we have these innocuous AI that are not really visible to you, they're there and they work well, right? Clearly, because like you you find things you enjoy, and you're like, wow, I don't know how it knew I like this, but I just I I fuck with this, right? Like, how many times have you done that? <laughs> like and it's it's i think part of that too is like at least for me is like it's it's you have to be like aware and also too is like if you try to outsmart the ai it's just not going to work for one thing like these these systems are are like built to be like a <laughs> a, a freaking like you have an army of engineers behind you that are trying to get you hooked on the dopamine drip right i mean i'm being inflammatory saying that but that's effectively what's going on um and the only way you opt out of some of this stuff is by not engaging at all. But like someone like me and you, Joe, who've grown up around this stuff, it's like, it's too fucking late. Like, yeah. <laughs> like unless you delete your profile, which good luck trying to do that on some of these platforms, um, you're basically, you have a digital profile that is going to be used by all these companies and they know a lot about you. And I'd honestly be really curious as to see like what they know about you because I'm pretty sure like if you go to Amazon or something like that, they have a good idea of like without you telling them, they have a good idea of what you make for a living, what how much you actually make for a living, um, what kind of job you have, and a whole bunch of other demographic like materials. Race, age, right? Yeah. Are you, <laughs> you have kids, right? Are you buying diapers? Right. Stuff they, like that. They like, probably guess they could probably intuit 
how many kids you have by the number of diapers that you purchase on a monthly basis. Probably. Right. That's the level of intrusion that they do. And it's not even that difficult. Like I, I played this game before where people were like trying to be, so like, say you don't know, like for location tracking per se, right? Say you are really cognizant and you have all the location tracking turned off on your phone. For the average person, it'd be actually really easily to, to triangulate your, your position if you do the same thing like five days a week, going to work or whatever, or go to the same places every day. Because you, even if you don't have privacy things, it would send pings to all the local Wi-Fis that you use, like Starbucks, the gym, or whatever myriad of places your, your phone connects to automatically. All it needs that is, is in, in, in timestamps and it could triangulate roughly where you live or where you frequent. And it could create a e really easy heat map to understand who you are and where you live and, and without being super intrusive, you know? And it's like, like we're not very smart when it comes to this stuff. Like this is kind of rudimentary <laughs> and like we get worried about the government. Personality. They can figure right. out personality. <laughs> and they have a heat map of all the places that you visit in your local right. area and you have an expansive heat map then they can intuit that you're open mm. that you're you're you have a you're high in openness on a big five personality dimension it's like uh oh yeah so now they're getting a sense of oh okay well now we should start marketing travel to you <laughs> right like i don't know it's just people get worried about this ai art thing maybe because it's like some there's something innately human about art that people latch on to. Um, we hope it's our but, but like these AI things are have been around and they're not going away and they're just going to get better. Um, and it's just a matter of time to see what happens to be some, to, to be totally honest in some of, the, some of these situations. Cause like if computing power keeps getting better, that just means we can do more with less effectively. Like, <laughs> like as computing gets better that means all of a sudden like the constraints we once had just start to evaporate and it's like wait now we have all this extra bandwidth or overhead and power to scale these things and see like well what happens what happens if we scale it like Fuck. like we don't need to have massive supercomputers or quantum computers because if you have i mean like my computer sitting at my feet is infinitely more powerful than anything we were using in the 70s like one of the funny things that my engineering teachers would tell us when we first got into school was that our um if you remember this joe the ti-84 calculators we used sure. if you're if you're too young you might not even use these anymore i don't even know what you guys use anymore but those ti-84 calculators had more computing power than what was used to get us to the moon so if those calculators had more computing power that got us to the moon our cell phones are Goddamn near godlike in comparison. Wait until these AI are trying to figure out how to get us to Mars. We'll be there, don't we? <laughs> if we can figure that out, I mean, if we really want to do anything space travel, you're going to need insane predictive models. I mean, it's, it's, you're talking about calculus at a level that, like, it's mind bending. We can even do like the DART mission, if you've heard of that one, Joe. Um, DART was a, the first attempt at, trying to impact an asteroid to change its trajectory oh this was recent yeah they had the, the the camera footage of the of the like leading up to the impact and what made so part of what made that cool um and this is kind of a tangent but i think it did it had to use some sort of predictive model because if you're trying to make minute calculations that far away on, on hitting a small target you wouldn't be able to do that by sending signals um from like earth to the satellite that just wouldn't work um, but basically what they did is they found a stellar body. So they had an asteroid, like a comet or something. It might have been, an, I don't know what the classification is. But anyways, the DART mission had an asteroid. But basically, like, being able to predict whether or not you changed the path of an asteroid is really difficult, right? Unless you know the full um, orbit of the object. But if you're only moving at, like, less than a degree, you're not going to be able to measure that. It would take, you know, years of data collection to do that. But th in this unique case for DART is they found a asteroid that had a secondary object that was orbiting it. And they could tell the period of that orbit. And so when they shot the DART asteroid, they impacted the smaller um, cam uh, asteroid body 
and within like 24 to 48 hours or of after impact they could already notice a deviation in the orbit of that secondary body uh -huh. and so even with a small satellite we can prove that given enough force and with accuracy we can impact a lunar body or a stellar body i should say so that's very cool it's very cool and but it's like that shows the power of some of these ai things that we're doing right because that's really high level mathematics in real time to triangulate positioning and targeting of things moving hundreds of miles an hour <laughs> like yeah, yeah the real scary thing to me is that that's very cool right so the positive aspect of these ai is that they can they can be immensely powerful tools and do things that humans just cannot it's just yeah. it's too complicated and uh, and so that's pretty remarkable the danger is that they speciate and they become in some sense their own thing and yes. start to be parasites on human beings like facebook and instagram already are like right yeah. sucking your attention from you um but the, the the third worry, I guess, second worry that I have with it <laughs> is, um, is that they're delicate. Hmm. Is that they're dependent on a inordinate for it to sustain. And so if something goes wrong and, you know, the, it's like winter comes and the leaves fall off. Right. You know, it's like, well, it's predicated. Those leaves were predicated on a certain amount of sunlight and energy and mm -hmm. uh, heat and all these things. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that I mean, that is a severe worry, right? Like how much if we're reliant on these systems and, you know, underlying code, not even AI, right? Like, say you're just using advanced code that shortcuts some of this stuff. Um, like, what are we atrophying ourselves from? Like, right. like, there's people that knew how to do some of these things, but because, you know, these computer programs do so much of the heavy lifting these days, we just like, well, doesn't matter, right? Like, we don't care. Um, and, and that's a, honestly a severe worry um, because if we if we forget, right, or say, God forbid, there's some catastrophe and there's, there's a certain subsection of people who knew how these things work. I mean, to look no further than Twitter, right? I mean... Part of the problems going on at Twitter is that there was a massive reshuffling of people who understood how the coding of the platform worked. And then now Elon Musk comes in with his team and whoever else, and he's trying to understand it. Even though he's an experienced coder to some degree, understanding the code base of another person's product is not an easy task. And mm -hmm. now he's calling back a whole bunch of engineers who understand the code base or trying to understand the code base and hearing it from them. And it's like, you can be the most intelligent person in the world, but if you don't understand what the fuck's going on, you're just not gonna be able to do it. It's better to start over. I, I, and I hate to say that, but like, <laughs> like, like, I mean, I'm using Twitter and maybe I, that's like a hotbed topic to bring up right now, but it, it's kind of the reality of these technical problems. Yeah, that's a, that's a weird, it's a very weird issue. That, that it's almost like, There's some philosopher, fuck, the, whose name I cannot remember. <laughs> Talked to Sam Harris about this. Listen to it when I was still living in Michigan. Um, there was this idea that there's some number of tools that we make that actually undercut our ability. They don't allow us to grow. They actually, um, in some sense, undermine us. Interesting. Like, take Google Maps. Right. So Google Maps uh, is a very useful tool, but we become dependent on, or you can become dependent on Google. Or generally, right? Mm -hmm. That that practice is necessary that in order to get around your map of the world, of your neighborhood, of your city, what have you, how to navigate that without a map is effectively short circuited by your dependence on the Google Maps tool. 
and that we could end up creating a bunch of AI that do a bunch of things for us. And they're sort of like bad parents. And that bad parents will just, oh man, I'm going to follow you around and solve all your problems for you. <laughs> right, bulldozing all your problems out of the way. Right, and so the child grows up never having to figure anything out for themselves. Yeah. And then we're creating a civilization like that. And we're just going to be a bunch of whiny little shit. I, I've been playing around <laughs> with this idea in my brain a little bit, like from a sci-fi standpoint of like, like say we crank this up to a hundred or whatever, like you go a hundred years in the future. Right. And we've, I'm just like imagining the birth of a new religion where instead of having, um, you know, the, the old school religions, you have people who, who believe in this super intelligent AI. Right. And it doesn't even need to be like, look like a human. It could just be like a block of code, three dimension hologram thing. It doesn't even look human, but yeah. there's a certain subsection of people that, because this thing is so, you know, it has all the data in it and it it can spit out any sort of response that you want, people are just going to believe it, right? They're going to turn to that to be the, the quote-unquote overlord rather than trusting in people or trusting in their own intuitions, right? And in some sense, it's like, well, if that's true, does that mean, like, can, but can a machine be wrong in, in some sense, right? Like, it kind of comes into question because... A machine is only as good as the inputs you put into it. I've actually thought about this in the form of the brain. Like the brain is trying to figure out it like like the brain doesn't have any direct outputs except your eyes technically, but it's using the vehicle of your body to try and make a picture of the world or the environment it's in. It's hyper adaptive because you're not fully developed when you're born, right? And so it basically is taking input from the external world with the sensors it has, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, and all that kind of stuff, and is trying to create a, a representation of that in real time, and it's refining it all the time. And to me, it's like, if you try to do this with an AI and it doesn't have any senses, what are you doing in some sense? It's like, we're we might be selecting for the wrong things, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, and to your point, like, the brain developed over billions of years. Yes. <laughs> and it was tested under the most like brutal of circumstances. Yeah. Like, you survive death. or die. Survive right. or die. <laughs> there's a very high incentive to its success. Right. <laughs> and in fact, it's like the ultimate. It's the ultimate, ultimate crucible. <laughs> um, nearly ultimate. Incentive. But um, this means, but because of its complexity, uh, we don't understand it. It's too, it's too much. It's yeah. too complex for us to understand. So if we make a cheat model that we can't understand of the brain, it's not the brain itself. It's a representation of the brain. And then it becomes complex enough on its own accord in order such that we can't understand it. We can't even understand its differences from the brain. Um, and we start to worship it then it could look as if it as powerful and like how do you say as um, omniscient omnipotent yeah <laughs> yeah as as something like a super brain without recognizing that in the details it's staggeringly divergent and inadequate and then it leads you remarkably astray yeah. to a place, of, a place of of horrendous destruction and that's that's pretty scary that the yeah. people could start to worship that thing like a god without recognizing that it's just vapid stupid bullshit right i mean plus we're already seeing like the problems with just like having an ai that gives you what you want right like oh, a yeah. lot of the like a lot of these ais like the the algorithms we see are the rather the companies fall back on it saying well we're not a problem because we're just giving the user what they already enjoy and then so they have a plausible deniability saying we're just providing the thing that people already want it's like saying a cigarette company is not culpable for damages because it's like well people want cigarettes i'm just giving them cigarettes right? yeah but what people want is <laughs> shit <laughs> so there are I mean, people out there who want to kill us yes. there are people yeah. out there that want to see snuff films and than child pornography. Right. Dark so, shit. The idea 
that right, the moment that AI start being very, very, very powerful and effective and providing you for what you would like to see, like to see what you want, yeah, then it becomes a nightmare because they will produce for people deep fakes of their favorite celebrity doing being murdered you could imagine right Blech. it'll get to the point where these are videos videos of scarlett johansson being beheaded by isis can will eventually be within the purview of these ai systems yeah okay that's not even remotely outside the realm of possibility that's i mean so, people could already create that kind of stuff there. yeah <laughs> it wouldn't take very long say nothing of your favorite child actor being put in some dark positions okay and people were get, are going to make arguments saying that oh well they didn't really experience it and because they didn't really experience by these sorts of things is is actually what we're actually concerned about ethically is whether or not the child can consent and they can't consent because they're a child but this is actually the child so what's wrong with this you're, you're gonna get the that of it no. <laughs> <laughs> the principle of that is disgusting yeah i mean i think we just have to be really smart about where we're what we're playing with i mean we're it's like we're playing with Pandora's box a little bit. Um, yeah, and I think it's already been creaked open. Yeah, it's the latch is undone, the hinges are greased. I still think we need to like the people, like the humans, need to be the ones controlling it. Like I think once once the AI is generating things of its own accord, right? Like you could imagine some sort of like algorithm just posts stuff. Like I'm sure that it's in the works somewhere. Um, that's when I think it needs to I be don't... embodied. I think yeah. I can't imagine that this thing um, could be ethical without being embodied and placed in a circumstance where it has to learn the social cues of human beings, right? And in its standing and all the all these constraints that human beings have to satisfy in their social environments are also constraints on it and yeah. so that it has to, because if morality is something that emerged as a result of our interactions with each other then the best bet for getting this thing to develop a morality is for it to interact with us in a more concrete way yeah i mean i think we, we already see what happens to people when they spend too much time online right like why would we expect right. our yeah, ais fucking mind <laughs> like what would you why would you expect the ai to interact any differently if it doesn't have like a physical connection to the world and people to learn from right, right. like when you divorce you know, its, the consequences of its actions um right sufficiently from well for, from it right that you sufficiently divorce its actions from their consequence then it starts to believe that there are no consequences to its actions and then it's unconstrained right and that's that's something like um it loses his mind that's people on 8chan right <laughs> that, was exact, that was actually like in the cesspools of the internet or i mean even in twitter it can be like this to some degree where it's like a like a looney tunes version of reality <laughs> I, think was the, I think it was the um the shooter in New Zealand a handful of years back, who was an HF yeah. guy, in live streamed the murders. Dude, that's fucking people wild. on HM, I think it was New Zealand. And we're saying things like, make sure to reload fast. Like, hope you brought the ammo. And like making jokes. That dude felt funny. Things like this, where they, they would make kind of almost gamer like jokes, the whole thing, as if what they were so witnessing. Weird. Weird. wasn't the murder of innocent people but was um knocking down targets in call of duty black ops right and so you can get to a place where you're so divorced from reality where the the consequences of your behavior so distant from your actions and your words and the way that you behave that you're unable to put two and two together 
And if an AI ends up in that position with the power that it has, then the consequences will be more than some school in New Zealand. It could very easily be everyone you know. We're in a wild west. Or a simulation. <laughs> yeah, fuck. <laughs> I mean, All right, what do you say we end on that happy note? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we covered a lot of ground in this one. Yeah. Um, the kind of more of a general AI ethical cu- question toward the end there, but um, mm. hopefully we covered some of what is going on in the art world with AI right now. Yeah. I don't think it's going anywhere. People can scream and moan and whatnot, but yeah, and it's not obvious <clears throat> what the solutions to something like this are, but yeah, somebody will listen be inspired to figure that out. Hopefully. I mean, the weird thing about this is there's not like a singular voice in all of this um, because it feels so dispersed with like just people who enjoy making images that there's not like one big name behind it and being like, well, this is how we think we should do it. Um, because I mean, how do you, how do you put art into one bottle like that? I don't think you could. Right. <laughs> so it, that maybe there's not, it, there's just too much space to be able to have one voice that rises above the rest. It's just people exploring as they see fit. Um, and hopefully that's what, I mean, that's what they, what this was it's for too, because uh, it's an evolving conversation and I'm sure Within the next two weeks or something, there's going to be an update and something else is going to happen. <laughs> so we'll see where it goes. <laughs> All right. Well, anyways, everybody, uh, we'll see you next week. And if you haven't, there is also in, in the world of AI and other weird futuristic uh, technology things, uh, Neuralink did a presentation last week, which is really a tech demo to recruit people. But Neuralink is wild, and um, I didn't bring it up earlier, Joe, but like, if, if you could somehow have a Neuralink device and you can stream things right into people's brains with what some of those dark examples, like imagine a Black Mirror version of Neuralink. Let's just leave it at that. Fuck. To, 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 leave it on a, to leave it on a dark note again. But also, if you really are interested in what Neuralink's doing, my God, is that stuff fucking sci-fi. So go watch that if 